I woke up at dawn. I ended up walking down to the banks of the Ganga. This is Varanasi. Uh, what a beautiful place. It's, a, it's in, a, in a bow in a river, a holy river, where at the very heart of the city, a fire burns, the fire of Shiva. It's been burning for 7,000 years, they say. Like the Olympic fire, right? Uh, we've got the former prime minister of Greece here, so we're talking about Olympics here. But that fire, that, that fire that burns, the fire of Shiva, it represents something very deep. It represents a moment of transition. You know, the idea of destruction also comes with birth. Death and birth, death and birth. And the ceremonies there on those, on those sacred waters, they, they, you know, it's a ritual. It's a series of rituals that exist there that, that take you to an altered state a place where your mind is free to accept an entirely new reality. Maybe your loved one just died and you're burning their body there in an effort to send them to nirvana. But actually for you, the ceremonies, the beating of the drums take you to a place where you can accept that. You can create a new reality. For me, the reason why that's very important is because I've had many moments in my life that have been defined by transition. Uh, I, I was, three years ago, well, before that, I was running around the world on a, a research scientist with UC San Diego, an explorer for the National Geographic Society, searching for tombs all over the world, making films, adventuring. And then in one moment, I found myself changed. In a moment of blood and dust and dirt, I was riding along in my friend's car, and then I was crushed under a vehicle when he flipped the car. Crushed to the point of no return. My leg, well, this is moving on its own. My leg was taken from me. Uh, I, yeah, I have a prosthetic leg. You want to see it, I'm going to show you later, I promise. I learned how to walk again. I, I happened to live in San Diego where, um, where the Marines from the US Army come home after war. So the best in prosthetic care was available to me. So I, I slowly, I learned how to walk. I, I had a leg made for me, I learned how to move. Uh, I, I started feeling something very strange. I started feeling a, a, a feeling of pain in my toes. Yet there were no more toes. What is that? San Diego also happens to be the home of a very famous person uh, from this community, V.S. Ramachandran. Does anybody here know V.S.? Of course, yeah. A neuroscientist, a thinker, a philosopher, somebody who sort of defined the idea of the mind as something beyond the body, or started to play with that concept. We started working on trying to remove that pain using mirrors, a mirror between my legs to trick my mind into seeing Two legs again, to let go of a, of a moment of trauma. Yet every time he removed that mirror, the pain rushed back. We started looking around. I, I spent time with my mentor, Ramesh, who I mentioned, and, and he said, well, let me take you to Kundalini Yoga. This is a, a Sanskrit technology, described in Sanskrit, as, as a way to connect mind to body. I went and did meditation. I, I, I tried a lot of different things, but every time the mirror was removed, the pain would come back, I think because I'm not very good at yoga. What is the purpose behind those technologies, those, those beating drums across the world? Finally, we published a paper uh, about what worked. We combined the mirrors with a heavy dose of psilocybin, magic mushrooms. This is an image that was produced out of the uh, college, Imperial College, a research group led by Robin Carhart Earhart. It shows the brain's communication patterns under the use of psilocybin. Everything's active, everything's moving, everything's remapping. What happens when the brain remaps? I think what happens, my understanding, is that you're allowed to let go in those moments of connection of your former past, whatever that reality is you're struggling with, and you're allowed to accept something new, that, that concept of neuroplasticity. But it's not just mushrooms that'll get you there. It's all forms of culture, actually, in my understanding now. I've been chasing culture around the world, looking at different ways in which rhythm, music, sound, 
architecture feel like you've been taken to an altered state of consciousness. And in those moments where you feel so lost that you lose your ego, that you lose your sense of self, you're allowed to see a new perspective. And that's the simple truth, that you can create reality when you see something from a different perspective. Pain, loss, death. So with this, I was very lucky. You know, we started using things like heart rate variability sensors to try to do, uh, to try to do work between people meditating or playing music. This was actually really uh, a continuation of Ramesh Rao's research on bliss. The idea that you can actually start to sense these things within the body. This is two people dancing around and the imagery of those dots is created through their, their motion, through accelerometers, but we're also trying to measure their heart rate variability and see how it changes uh, when they're actually in a moment of collective flow. But this has been a continuous process. I had my leg built, I had my mind continuing to remap, it's never over, it's always a journey. And then I went back out into the world. I was given the, I was given the ability to move. I, was, I, I, I went back to running around some of the most intense places, uh, you know, diving into the depths of caves, going into the, into the underworld, doing the work that I had done before I lost my leg, but with this new sense, going to the most extreme conditions in the world, given the mobility of an explorer again, searching for those little bits of evidence that tell you that we exist in some deeper timeline of humanity. All because of the access to my leg and, and the ability to have community around me that showed me that I could get to a place where I could really remap my brain. This is what my packing looks like now. It's kind of strange to have a leg uh, in him. <laughs> The airport hates it, I promise you. Like, you think you have a hard time going through security? Imagine carrying a leg in your bag. It's, it's always very awkward. Uh, but I do it. And, and I know that I have a privilege, actually. I feel deeply privileged for this ability. Because I can afford it. I was in Colombia, high up in the mountains using lasers to map through trees and jungles to, to find these lost cities. And I came down onto the beach just for a, a moment between shoots. And I, at sunset, I met this man. He was watching his friends play soccer on his crutches. He had lost his leg in a car accident as well. Perez is his name. Not so long ago, about the same time I lost my leg. And he looked at me with a deep smile happiness and compassion. It didn't bother him. But it bothered me that I was the one running around the mountains, doing everything I wanted to do, kicking that soccer ball if I wanted to, and yet he was watching because he didn't have, what, money? Access? Why should something that is just a piece of hardware that can change your life be held just for those with money? I learned something through this process because it could happen to literally anybody, anybody in this room, anybody that you know, at any moment, without expectation. I learned that there's 40 million amputees around the world. 40 million. 40 million. You probably don't think that there's that many because you don't see them all that often because most of them, they're not walking around. Only 5% have access to prosthetics. That's just unfair. That's unfair, and I think we can change that. We, in this room, in this moment, can change that, actually. That's why we're here. One of the most inspirational stories, I think, in humanity. Uh, Jaipur Foot, born right here, Jaipur Foot, created by D.H. Mehta. His goal, he's a hero, his goal was to try to create something where anybody that walked in the door could walk away or that got in the door, could walk away with a limb. And he found a material and a process that allowed him to, to make it for very little money. So he made sure that nobody had to pay. There's been a lot of people that have been helped with this. A lot. However, those who can't make it there are still left outside. And f <laughs> I gotta tell you, in the morning before I put my leg on, I can't move. The amputee population is the most immobile population in the world, literally. They can't move. 
I started looking at the problem. How does this get made? What, what is actually the challenge? In fact, I lived the problem because I'm now an amputee. And what I realized is that the process to make a leg is very specific around the custom of each leg. Everybody's body is different. Some parts of it are cheap, the foot part, the part that actually is like a spring. You can make that out of a piece of bamboo or, or rubber tires, as is done with Jaipur foot, very innovatively. But the shaping, where somebody takes a plaster of Paris mold of my leg and then turns it into a socket through an imprint of that, this is the same thing happening at Jaipur foot. This is in my clinic in San Diego with one of the world's best clinics, Jaipur foot. Mine, exactly the same process. Shaping the leg, shaping the leg. How do you get something that can fit well? How do you create something at scale that's distributed evenly across the planet if every single one of those pieces has to be custom? How do you do that? How do you solve this manufacturing problem? Well, the way we did it was turning to the best and the brightest that I knew, the students of UC San Diego. Over there in the blue, look at the blue. Can you guys stand up for a second? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So remember the blue shirts, because the blue shirts are very important. We wanna, we're here for a reason. I want to tell you what we came up with, but I'll just show you a video instead, because it's, it's got music and it's more exciting. So let me show you the video. There are 40 million amputees in the world, and about a year and a half ago, I became one of them. And I'm lucky because I had access to the best in terms of prosthetic care. The functionality of this all depends on how well this custom piece fits to your body. And every single one has to be different for each individual. But for 40 million people out there who have also lost their limbs, the large majority won't be able to afford something like this because they can't travel to a doctor who can shape this. We're going to take cell phones and turn them into a teleportation device through photogrammetry, the capturing of a 3D model with just photographs and by leveraging technology already in most people's pockets to make it so any ordinary citizen can take somebody's body from the streets of Mumbai to the mountains of Nepal and transport them to a 3D printer or a network of 3D printers that could then provide these individuals with the ability to live again, to move again, to have functionality, to print out a part of their body that could then be used to give 40 million people their lives back. And we have the technology solution and the network to be able to do this now. We just need the resources. This is Project Limitless. We're using cell phones. Why? Because they're in everyone's pockets already. They're already there. We're not gonna create something where you have to send something out into the world. We're gonna say we're gonna take over what's already there. The largest piece of infrastructure we have collectively is the cell phones in our pockets. If you put them all together, it's a massive web, which is much more than a way to make a phone call or check your Instagram. I think this is the nascent age of teleportation. What we're doing is we're using technology that we developed in many different places. I used it in archaeology. It's called photogrammetry. You can look at an object. Uh, you can look at this sign here. And you just see it as a 2D object from where you sit. But from where I see it, I see other angles. And then I see other angles from behind. And if I get a bunch of different angles, I can create a 3D model of that sign. The cell phone has a camera, and it's got a gimbal. It knows where it is. It's got a brain. So I just move it around my leg, do, 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 and all of a sudden, I've got a model of my body that can teleport itself anywhere in the world. You can transport somebody who can't move somewhere. The concept that we're developing now is saying that if there's 40 million amputees in the world which can't be in one location, they're everywhere, then can we take people's cell phones and say, if you walk by somebody, instead of just saying, I feel bad, or you look away, or you give a little money, you, you don't have to. You could pull out your phone and you could do something about it. The idea is that we're going to build a series of Kiosks. This was an, idea, was an idea we came up with early on. I was like, can we build these little portals around the world where people down here could be mapping someone's body, doing a little circle, and I, I swear it takes one swipe now. The students have built this app that literally works in less than a minute, where they just go around my leg, and in a minute, it's done. They're trying to build it where you don't need language to understand the process. They're thinking through all of the user design challenges that all the engineers face. 
but from a standpoint of how do you make something that anybody can use to create that model and then send that data to a kiosk. And each one of those places has a printer. And in those printers, all those different printers, you might be able to create legs that end up back in these people's lives. The next part of this is can you actually add layers to this whole challenge? Can those same kiosks be where people bring plastics that they're using, that they're recycling now? Can we turn plastic waste across the planet into something that can change people's lives for the better? Yes, we can. One year ago, Ramesh Rao stood on the stage of ink, carrying a leg that was made for me. We were trying to make it work. It was a prototype. It didn't fit really well. But I'll tell you, the proof is in the pudding, because the leg that I've been wearing all night long was printed out from cell phone photos of my body. And this socket, this socket gives me mobility again. It was created with $20 worth of materials, one minute of a scan. The comparative leg, the one that I have at, at home that I built over months with an expert, cost me $10,000. And at Inc. Labs, we're taking on what started one year ago with Ramesh holding that leg. From that meeting, we started meeting people here. We met, and we're going to meet, the folks at Jaipur, Jaipur Foot. We met a team that runs the Sahaj network. Does anybody know that? This, this e-village network that's connected to 60,000 villages across rural India with kiosks to provide high-tech equipment for those rural villages. And the unbelievable thing is that they're also tied to a sister company that just got a center of excellence for 3D printing funded at the order of $10 million in Calcutta. So now we've got nodes into 60,000 villages across rural India, a 3D printer at the center of it, and a relationship with Jai Furfoot. And the reason why this has all come together is because these students, they made it happen. Because they know that change can happen. <laughs> They're the reason why I feel excited every single day. Because they know that change can happen. They come from a place where it's all about passion. Not a single one of them has been paid. There's not a single dollar involved. It's out of passion. And we're in this moment, in this time, in this room, in this place, to try to make change. To try to create a better world. Imagine first in the mind and then built into reality. The next time I meet this man or any other person that's sitting in a place that is very similar to mine, I want to say to them, we've got a solution. Because we all face those moments of transformation. We all face those moments of death and rebirth. But rebirth shouldn't be something that is a function of equity. It should be something that is distributed evenly. With that, I want to thank you all, and I look forward to finding ways where we can turn on the network. I need a, I need a campaign. I need a marketing campaign to let the world know that their cell phones are actually ready to help. I need somebody that's here in India to help us build and solidify that relationship with Jaipur Foot and with the Sahaj Network and turn on those kiosks and figure out how we can make this into a, a system where it all works together, an ecosystem of manufacturing. And then I need people to help me expand this to the world because this is the first place and we'll take it everywhere because it's literally already in everyone's pockets. And of course we need funding. <laughs> Everybody does. With that, I just want to say thank you.